بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على رسوله الأمين وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين أما بعد So the question is are we in the end of times and we have a lot to cover as far as the timeline and I'm trying to be brief um, and also we have a lot of uh, like foundational rules to lay all right first of all one of the one of the things that every era is guilty of is that they interpret their signs to fit their current world I guarantee you when it was World War II Many Muslims thought, this is it, these are the malahim, these are, this is the end of time. I guarantee you when the Spanish flu hit in 1919 or 1918, whatever it was, people felt like, you know what, this is it, these are the end of times. And when coronavirus hit, what happened? People kept saying, these are the end of times. They're, I mean, this is just not unique to us. Every generation or time period, they will interpret the signs according to that present world. For, there was uh, one of the scholars in Al Andalus, which is about 800 years ago, and he was so certain that the Mahdi is going to emerge in his lifetime. And he felt that if the Mahdi doesn't emerge in his lifetime, he's just going to miss him. So he used to tell the students, when you see the Mahdi, give him salam from me. He was certain. We look at the hadith of the man's, the tip of his whip speaking to him, and his shoe speaking to him, and his thigh speaking to him. And what do you say immediately? It's a cell phone. Because we are, we are susceptible to um, interpreting the signs according to our world. His thigh speaking to him, that's the cell phone. I, it's, but that's not his thigh speaking to him. And the hadith says his thigh will speak to him and inform him of what his family did in his absence. When you pick up your phone from your pocket, which is resting on your thigh, you speak to your family and they tell you what happened in your absence. Not your thigh telling you. And then what about the sandals speaking to them? And Apple still hasn't made a shoe. The eye shoe coming in three years. So it's, but we're always guilty of that. Okay, so we've got a couple of things. Number one, the signs don't always have to be in this current world. Two, you have to stick to the chrono chronological order of the signs. Now, I don't want to mention any names because they might be fans, but there was, uh, there was a speaker who was popular for talking about the signs before the and he messes up the timeline, timeline like crazy. He actually has photos of the, the dam, the barrier of Yerjuj and Majuj. He has photos. He said it was broken 12 years ago and they came out. The Dajjal, that's the British, okay? Look, I can't stand the British just like the next person, but I'm not gonna, go, I'm just kidding. I'm not gonna go as far and say, uh, to say that the Dajjal doesn't even fit. The Dajjal is a human being. The Prophet he's a human, and the Prophet when he described the Dajjal, he said, I'll tell you who looks like him. Ibn Qatan looks kind of like him. You see? So that's not a system, that's not a new world order. You have to stick with the order of things, the, chronolo the chronological timetable. You can't just change it around. Yeah. And because we're dealing with the unseen, one of the biggest red flags is when somebody is certain about something and they give you dates and times and locations. But how is it the unseen if you have like you know it so well? How is that possible? That's one of the red flags. If you're ever to listen, if you're listening to anybody who's doing a series on the end of times, and they're speaking very precisely, they're giving you dates, they're saying there's no other interpretation, no room for any other explanation, don't listen to that person anymore. Not even a little bit. Yeah, because how would you know? And there's so many things that are open to many plausible explanations, all right? So before the Dajjal emerges, there is a, a thought that the Dajjal came out. So the Prophet ﷺ says the Muslims will send 10 scouts to check if, if this news is true or not. Then the Prophet ﷺ swears by Allah. He says, I know their names and the names of their fathers and the colors of their horses. And this is later on. Uh-oh. Horses? What happened to cars? Motorcycles? Airplanes? No more? Tesla doesn't succeed into the next... Uh, that's it? Not even electric cars? 
All right. Prophet ﷺ mentions arrows. He says that a group will go and conquer Constantinople, which is Istanbul, and they're not going to fire a single arrow. So got arrows, spears, horses, five words, everything else. What do you think? What would happen when people would have to use arrows and spears? Or do you have an explanation for that? I'm asking you, really. Nam? This computer systems get jammed? Okay. So like, like some nerds are going to jam it? Well, uh, yeah, we hope. <sighs> okay, fine. All right. Huh? Advanced arrows. So they're not really just wooden arrows. They're like Rambo exploding tips. Huh? Okay, anything else? Any other explanation? So, so why did the Prophet say arrow then? If it's a bullet. Okay, good. Zakallahir. And that's so everything you said is plausible. Like everything that was said now makes sense. It's plausible. But for me to insist on one of these three statements, how would I know? It's the unseen. But people always like interpret it like as if Jibreel told them yesterday. So you just said that it could be that the Prophet is just speaking to them in terms they understand. Yeah, and he didn't say they will con conquer Constantinople without firing a single RPG. RPG <laughs> he would use a language that they can understand. That's one. So when he says horses, he doesn't want to say motorcycles and have to explain the internal combustion engine and all that stuff. Confusing. That's one. Or two, there could be technology that can still be on horses. So the, the scholars actually mentioned this example. They said, if you ever watch the videos of the jihad in Afghanistan, of course, when we say jihad in Afghanistan, we mean against the Russians. That was a joke. Against America, like, oh, but against the Russians, that was jihad. So anyways, you watch these old videos, you know, 80s, 70s, and you'll see the Russians on their helicopters and tanks and the Afghans were on horseback. Why? Because the terrain allowed them to be on horseback, actually even gave them an advantage to be on horseback, even though they were fighting an, an, an enemy that was on tanks and other kind of machinery. So it, the fact that the Prophet mentions horses, we don't have to necessarily assume that technology will be uh, you know, done. And, but could it also be that there's no more technology? Could it be? Possible. But what, what could cause no technology because like I guarantee that even if there's a nuclear bomb and the whole world is finished there's going to be a gun and some bullets in Texas I guarantee it I know it just open any random house you're the only survivor on earth you're going to find guns and bullets so why do I have to go to arrows all right what so what, what do you think what could cause no more technology no internet huh but Allah's plan is usually, they're always means, right? Yeah, and like we won't wake up and find our phones missing. Our children going to depression and stuff. There's always something like, what? Now? World War Three. So, so sometimes people say that. So there's going to be like, uh, if there's a World War Three, or four or five, whichever, however you count, it doesn't matter. And then there's the end of technology and the end of civilization and people kind of start over. Okay. And, and, and maybe you can fill in the blanks. Like, why do they start over? Like, there's some adults alive. Like, why do you start with bows again? And you know how things work. Anyways, possible. Some people say there's thir certain catastrophic events that could, you know, change the world. Like, if there's a solar flare from the sun, which they say there's only a 10% chance of that ever happening. But that would knock off every electrical equipment, piece of equipment on the planet, all right? Or they say if, the, if oil runs out, if oil runs out, like, uh, what is it? A huge percent of the world population will just die if oil runs out. Um, if the dollar collapses, so what I'm trying to say, let me see, I kind of jumped ahead here. So does the world we live in right now look anything 
close to the world where the Mahdi emerges, the Dajjal comes soon or shortly thereafter? The answer is no, absolutely not. And I'm going to give you the arguments or the evidence. But there's no way you look at it and you say, well, yeah, we're in that world. No way. I'll give you the evidence, inshallah. But even though I'm saying that, we're not in the world where the Mahdi comes out. We're not in that. We're, this is the description of how the world is right now. That is not the description of the world where the Mahdi emerges or the things that are supposed to happen happen. Doesn't look anything like it. But with, even with saying and believing that, I'll tell you that if certain catastrophic events happen, in 10 years, the whole world will look just like that world. In just 10 years. So that's why when you're dealing with the unseen, you don't know how much it can change. Yeah, and for example, I was watching a documentary on the, uh, and it obviously made by non-Muslims, it was about uh, when the dollar collapses, right? And they, in, many, in the many points they mentioned, they said that if the dollar collapses, the, pe the, the places on earth that will be most immediately and severely affected by the collapse of the dollar are the ones that have the strongest link to the dollar. So specifically, they mentioned Britain and they mentioned Israel. And they said the dollar collapses, those two places will feel it the most. Or they'll yani, subsequently collapse as well. So if the dollar collapses tomorrow, what would the world look like in 10 years? If China doesn't step up their game, <laughs> it would look really bad. And it could look very much like the world before when all that turmoil happens. Okay. Now, we've got a couple of things. So, so, so I'm saying we're not in that world, but I'm also saying we're dealing with the unseen. It can change in five years, in 10, in 15 years. It could completely change and look like this dystopian, you know, post-apocalyptic war world where the Dajjal and Mahdi and all these things emerge. Now, another thing is that, and you'll have things like, for example, people will say that Al-Mahdi will free Bayt Al-Maqdis. Al Mahdi is going to free Palestine. There is not a single hadith that says Al Mahdi will free Palestine. Not even a fabricated hadith that says the Mahdi is going to free Palestine. But you hear it all the time in Mahdi. Yep. When you say the Mahdi it will free Palestine, well, I, I don't know about you, but that takes hope away from me. Saharala, who else is with me? Yeah, I have, yeah, and you take hope away from me. You tell me. The people of Gaza and Palestine, they have to sit through this until the Mahdi comes. And everything we do is useless. Yani our dua won't help. And nothing will help. We just have to khamas, we just watch Netflix and when Mahdi comes, it's his job. Yani I'm going to do his job. Well, it takes hope away from you. Now, the Hadith says that he's going to be building trouble. Yes, and the hadith actually, the hadith mentions, it casually mentions that he'll, he'll be in Bayt al-Maqdis. This doesn't talk about freeing it. So the scholar said, the fact that he's going to go to Bayt al-Maqdis indicates that it's already free. It's a Muslim lo location that he just goes to. And he rules from there or he settles there. Yeah, because it's already free. Not a single hadith mentions that he frees it. That gives you more hope. That says, yeah, you can do things. Yani, Boycotting, la, wait till the Mahdi comes. Getting, resisting, masharif, la, la, just, you can't do anything till the Mahdi comes. No, that's not true. So, and then there are other indications also. Yani, the Dajjal, when he comes, he will have 70,000 from the Jews of Isfahan coming with him. Where are they coming towards? Towards Jerusalem. So the scholar said, so why are these Jews not in Jerusalem? You know, right? So, and by the way, and one of the dumbest things ever is if when someone tells you, oh, you said the Jews will follow the Dajjal and that's anti-Semitic. Okay, stop with the nonsense, all right? First of all, the Jews will follow the Dajjal. And guess what, ya Habib? The Christians will follow the Dajjal. The atheists will follow the Dajjal. And the Muslims will follow the Dajjal, mashallah, in droves. Prophet said a man will chain his wife to the pillars of the home so she doesn't go and join the Dajjal. And he says that she'll break free and join the Dajjal. So yeah, don't worry. We didn't say just the Jews. Muslims, barta. Yeah? Anyways, 
طيب So we've got a number of things and, and really the only hadith that I'm going to go into details is just one hadith that mentions three fitan trials that come one after the other. But we've got a number of things that would, you, would, you can argue need to happen before the Mahdi shows up. So are we in the world where the Mahdi emerges? First of all, the Euphrates River dries up. And this is a hadith Sahih Muslim and it uncovers a mountain of gold. And then people will rush to go get that gold. And the Prophet said from every 100, 99 people will die trying to get the gold. And then one narration of the Prophet says, each person will tell himself, perhaps I'm the one who's going to make it. And you tell them, Habibi, there's a 99% chance you will be killed. He's like, yes, but there's that one. Don't do it. Don't go. Now, why did the Prophet tell us about this hadith or this incident? The scholar said, the Prophet tells you these things so you know how to act when they happen. So, when the Euphrates dries, and by the way, the Euphrates is drying, right? Have you seen video pictures? It's insane. There's some areas that just looks like desert. You don't even know that there was a, a river there. It is drying up. But when it dries up, and then you hear on Al Jazeera that there's a mountain of gold discovered, don't buy your plane ticket. That's exactly why the Prophet told you, so you know how to act when it happens. So, the Euphrates River dries up in a mountain of gold and a lot of killing happens. That happens before the Mahdi. Arabia turns into rivers and greenery. But I know we're all on these WhatsApp groups. You have seen some insane videos, true or false. Some crazy videos of and before and after where it was completely desert and now it's just green, luscious greenery everywhere. But what I love, 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 love about this hadith is the Prophet says, that the hour will not be established until Arabia returns to greenery. That's, that's a genuine prophet. Returns to greenery. If you were living 1,400 years ago and you're standing next to the Prophet and he says returns to being green, you tell him, Ya Rasulullah, this, this used to be green. I mean, there's nothing. You've seen it. You've been to Mecca. It's rough terrain. Not even just rocks and rough. Nothing green whatsoever. So... Would you have believed that this place used to be green? And I don't have time to go into all the evidence and all that, but uh, there's a lot. I mean, there's the evidence that you can't refute that Arabia used to be green and used to have animals and greenery and plants. What's the easiest evidence? The easiest one. There's archaeological evidence. They found elephant tusks in the desert. Oil, Habib. Oil, but gold. What was oil? And like carbon-based organisms that used to live a long time ago. And then uh, and what happened? It became oil. So that's proof. We know that. But how would the Prophet know it if he wasn't a genuine Prophet Wasallam? So that is happening. But it's not done yet. It just started happening. Euphrates River is drying up. It's happening. But it's not. And the mountain didn't show up yet. Then we have, well, okay. So it gets tricky. I'm gonna, this, this is the one hadith that we're going to focus on for uh, tonight, inshallah. This is uh, a hadith narrated by Abu Dawood and Imam Ahmad. And Al-Hakim said it is Sahih. And uh, Dhabi also, rahimahumullah. This is Abdullah ibn Umar, the son of Umar ibn Khattab. He says, Kunna qu'udan inda Rasulillahi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We were sitting with the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he started to mention the different trials, yani the different trials and tribulations, the tests that are going to happen towards the end of times. Which, let me stop for a second. Now, if, uh, if you want to get technical, we are in the end of times, meaning if you consider the age of the earth, right? Where are we? And yani if this is the beginning of the earth, and this is the end of the earth, where do you imagine we, we would be? Here, in the very beginning, the halfway point, the ending, right? So, if you want to get, sometimes people, they want to just argue with you. No, we are in the, okay, fine. In that sense, we're in the end of times. But are we at the events of the end of times? That's what we're saying. Because the Prophet ﷺ said, بُعِثْتُ أَنَا وَالسَّاعَةَ كَهَاتَيْنَ I and the hour were sent like these two. Some scholars said, meaning, I'm a little bit ahead of it. It's right behind me. And others said, meaning, just like there's nothing between this finger and this finger, there's nothing between my sending and the hour. 
So we are towards the end. If you look at the, the, the span of the earth, we're, to, we're here at the end. Yeah? Okay. Does that make sense to everybody? Because I have a great analogy, but I don't want to spend time. If it makes sense, we'll move on. So the Prophet uh, so Abdullah ibn Umar says, and Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he was mentioning the fitan, uh, the, uh, the trials, the different tests. فَأَكْثَرَ فِي ذِكْرِهَا So he, he spoke a lot about that. He, he went deep into it. Like he kept talking for a long time. Which shows you, Prophet ﷺ spent time with this. And he didn't, that's not the only thing he taught them, but he did speak about this a lot. Then he says, حَتَّى ذَكَرَ فِتْنَةَ الْأَحْلَاسِ Until he mentioned the fitna of al-ahlas. So these are three fitna in this hadith that follow one after the other. And we're going to look at them because they describe the world where the Mahdi emerges. And let's see, are we there? Did any of these three happen yet? Fitnat al-Ahlas. فَقَالَ قَائِلٌ يَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ وَمَا فِتْنَةُ الْأَحْلَاسِ He said, O Prophet of Allah, what is the fitna of al-Ahlas? قَالَ هِيَا هَرَبٌ وَحَرْبٌ أَوْ وَحَرَبْ There are different ways of reading it. Okay. ثُمَّ I guess we'll come, you know, let me explain it as we go. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Fitnat al-Ahlas. Al-Ahlas is the plural of al-Hils. Hils. Hils is this cloth that you put on the back of the camel before you put the saddle or the haudaj, the sedan, or whatever else you put. You usually put a cloth on the back of the camel, and that's between its skin and whatever wooden saddle or anything else you put there. So why did the Prophet call the Fitnah al ahlas Because any time you look at a camel with a saddle on, there's a hils there. فَهِيَا mulazima. يعني it's always there and it's continuous. So from the name of the fitna, you get a, a, a clue as to the, the nature of the fitna. That is a fitna that is continuous. And hils is always on the back of the camel. If there's a saddle, there's a hils. It's never gone. So it's continuous. And it's always there. So um, they said, what is fitna with al-ahlas? He said, it is going to be harabun wa harab aw wa harb. So harab, basically, people will, uh, just like in hurub, people will run away from one another. There's so much killing that people, when you see a person, you run away. You don't want to encounter them because they will probably kill you. A lot of killing for whatever reason. Are we at that stage yet? And, but it's not talking about, um, yeah, but that's what's happening right now in, in this country. No, it's talking about something on a bigger scale. So, and then the, the harab, um, that basically that, uh, well, the two explanations. One is that, that people will lose their families and their wealth. So that's one explanation. People will lose their family and their wealth. The other, that, uh, that basically it will be wars. Yeah, need a lot of killing. There will be a lot of killing and people will stay away from each other and people will be robbing and looting each other so this is fitnat al-ahlas طيب, let's get them all together so we can get the, a, a good picture then the Prophet ﷺ says thumma so after it and the scholar said thumma and thumma you see that it's happening one after the other it's not like a century later or something like that thumma fitnatu fitnatu sarra then the Prophet ﷺ says, دَخَنُهَا مِنْ تَحْتِ قَدَمَيْ رَجُلٍ مِنْ أَهْلِ بَيْتِ يَزْعُمُ أَنَّهُ مِنِّي وَلَيْسَ مِنِّي وَإِنَّمَا أَوْلِيَاءِ الْمُتَّقُونَ So he says, then there's going to be a fitna, and the Prophet ﷺ called it fitnat as-sarra. Because a trial and a test can be, if there is, uh, it can be bad, or you can be tested through good, which is like our case in America, and you're tested to see if you are thankful to Allah. Everything, alhamdulillah, is available. Electricity, running water, whatever you want, you get it. Not a problem. So this is another fitna. So the, some scholars said fitna is sarra because everything, there's a lot of ease and good. And that's the naming. The other scholars said it's sarra لأنها تسر العدو. The enemy is pleased with this fitna that's afflicting the Muslims. So it's making them happy. That's why Allah called it the fitna of uh, the Prophet called it fitna of sarra. But it'll be due to a man who was from my family. Yani his lineage traces back to the Prophet. And 
and and uh, but then the Prophet ﷺ distances himself from him. He says, but he is not from me. So he is from me, but he is not from me. Meaning, he is from me, but because of his behavior and his lack of righteousness, I am disting, distancing myself from him. So he is not from me. And and he says that, إِنَّمَا my close friends are المُتَّقُونَ The people who have taqwa. ثُمَّ Then, uh, yeah, then people will unite under ala rajulin under a man kawirikin kawarikin ala dila kawarikin ala dila. This is an expression to show lack of stability. Al warik ish is the thigh, the thigh muscle, and the dila the ribs. So if you get a, a rib bone which is small and thin like this and it's curved, and then you put the big thigh on top of it, what's going to happen? It's going to rock. So that's the visual you need. It's just an expression that means unstable. So people are going to then unite under a man, but he's going to be like a, a thigh bone on a rib bone. Yani he's going to be unstable. Thumma fitna tu duhayma. Then the fitna of a duhayma. A duhayma tasghir li dahma. A dahma means a black soda. So in Arabic, sometimes in English books, you'll find this translated as then this, the little black fitna. But in Arabic, sometimes you use the diminutive form to show that it's big. So a duhayma here doesn't mean the little black fitna, it means the big black fitna. لا تدعو أحدا من هذه الأمة إلا لطمته لطمة. It does not leave anyone from this ummah except that it afflicted him. Now, when people said it's COVID, what was wrong with that? I remember when COVID came out, people said, oh, this is fitna to duhayma. Tabi habib. When al ahlas, where about the ones before it? Where about the ones before it? Bas Yeah, we just pick one, khalas, this is it. Where about the ones before it? There are two before it, okay? And yes, it's true, but that's why we said, or we didn't say, but we're going to say, when a description matches an event, a description that we have of, of one of the signs, matches an event in our lifetime, all the other descriptions have to meet it as well. I know I've said this many times before. There is a very famous speaker, I'm not going to mention his name, okay? But he says the Dajjal is the television screen. The Dajjal is the TV. And he gives good arguments. He says the TV, the Dajjal is one-eyed, the TV is one screen. Tayyip. I'm going to get rid of my brain and say, okay, I agree with you. I is a screen now. Hadr. Okay. He said, why is he called the Dajjal? Because he lies all the time. Okay. So, what do you see from the TV? Lies all the time. Everything lies. News, lies. Commercial, lies. The sandwich in the commercial. The thing is falling in slow motion. The lettuce is sweating. The tomatoes kid at the... And it's spinning. When you buy it, it's like the guy stepped on it with his foot and gave it to you. Like, when the big one and the lettuce is, when well, <laughs> Lies everywhere. Okay? So, he said, and then the hadith says, the Dajjal enters every household. And the TV's in every household. Sounds good, sir. And if that's all I knew about the Dajjal, I'd be like, wallahi, hey, the guy makes sense. Right, but what's our rule? All the signs have to fit. Okay? The hadith also says that the Dajjal has a right eye and describes, uh, well, describes a, the, the other bad eye. And the Sahih Muslim it mentions it's the right eye and it's protruding like a grape. The hadith says that on his forehead it says kafir, not Sony. Uh, the hadith says that the Dajjal cannot enter Mecca and Medina. Is there, t is there, are there TV sets in Mecca and Medina? Yeah? The, the, the hadith mentions that the Dajjal will cut a young man in half. Uh, do they make a TV that does that? If they do, don't buy it. Well, why would you buy it? So, does it match now? It doesn't. So, yeah, it sounds like it's COVID. Fitnat al duhayma sounds like it's COVID. And it will not leave anyone from the ummah except that it touched them. Okay, put your hand up if COVID didn't affect you. Yani, no way. No way it didn't affect your job. 
didn't affect you going out, didn't affect you hanging out with friends and coming to the mess. No way. And probably nobody in the ummah. And I mean, there's a guy who's been living in the desert. He's 100 miles away in every direction from everybody. He didn't feel it. You know, he didn't social distance. Well, he was social distancing. He pushed it. <laughs> so you understand. So it's saying that no one from the ummah is unaffected by it. So you could say until here, halas, it's COVID. Yeah, but first of all, you just ignore the, the order of things, the first two. Then, um, where is it here? Yeah, and then it sounds like COVID, right? It says, فَإِذَا قِيلًا قَضَتْ تَمَادَتْ يعني Every time you think it's over, it comes back again. Remember? COVID, they said it's over, and now I forgot all the different names. There was version 1, and then there was uh, 2.0, right? Remember every time? Different names every time. Every time you think it's over, oh, there's another outbreak. There's another variant. <laughs> uh, here we go. Is this COVID? يصبح الرجل فيها مؤمنا ويمسي كافرا A man will wake up a Muslim and by evening he'll be a kafir. Did that happen with COVID? No. Alhamdulillah. حتى يصير الناس إلى فسطاطين until the people of the ummah يعني أمة محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم will split into two camps. فسطاته إيمان لا نفاق فيه a camp of Iman in which there is no hypocrisy and the camp of hypocrisy in which there is no Iman. Does it sound like COVID now? All the rules have to apply, all the descriptions have to apply. So it's not COVID at all now. Nobody wakes up a, a believer and then, you know, at night is a disbeliever or wakes up a disbeliever at night is a believer. Why is that happening anyways? Because of the trials. Yeah, and if someone would leave his religion from all the pressures and tests but the Prophet doesn't specify what is happening to people here. He doesn't specify. But clearly it's not COVID because we're not even done. Okay, we said a, a camp of Iman, no hypocrisy in it. A camp of hypocrisy, no Iman in it. Then he says, فَإِذَا كَانَ ذَاكُمْ فَانْتَظِرُ الدَّجَّالَ مِنْ يَوْمِهِ أَوْ مِنْ غَدِهِ When that happens, expect the Dajjal that day or the next. So now, where does this fall in our timeline? Could it be like today? We're far from it. We got to do, go through al-ahlas first. Then we got the, the guy who is a kawarikin ala dila, <laughs> that unstable guy. All right? And then we have to have this other fitna, duhayma. And then the ummah splits into two camps. And when that happens, Expected the jail to come right that day or the next day. Now, in the Nabi Sallallahu possibly there's hyperbole there to say how close it would be. But where do you think, which camp is the Mahdi in? The Iman camp, right? And so, fitan, do something amazing. They, and you know in Arabic you say, fitan to dhahab wal fiddah. Like when you want to purify the gold, how do you purify it? You put it over the fire. And so it meant these different ores melt at different temperatures. And then after this fire, you get the pure gold. And that's exactly what fitan do to the ummah. Because everybody's a great believer when the sun is out and the birds are singing. But then when there's a, a test, then you see the gold from the, the other. So basically, now this fitna, what it does, it, it, it splits everyone. Clearly we see who the hypocrites are and who are the people of Iman. So now, in a way, it's like it gets things ready for the Mahdi. So when the Mahdi comes, he knows his people, and there's no hypocrisy in the camp, and he doesn't have to think, is this guy a spy, is this, is this guy working for this group or that group? He knows he's, he's with the believers. And then what is Isa, I mean, the Mahdi himself, he does, he has, when Isa comes down, the Mahdi has already organized them. They're already an army, and he, they're already the righteous people. And so it's like everyone does the work that falls into place. So, yeah, I do. I think I described everything I want to. Yeah. Yeah. So when the, you see then, this gives you the timeline of when that's going to happen. So we've got the Euphrates drying up. We've got Arabia turning into rivers and greenery. And we've got these three fitan, one after the other. Before the Mahdi, other things happen. 
before the Mahdi comes out, there is a Khalifa. And he, when, if, some, if anyone tells you today, the Mahdi is out, tell him you're wrong. I met the Mahdi yesterday, you didn't. But how can you refute me before you even hear what I, my argument is? And I want you to meet him and say, well, I don't have to. He's not the Mahdi. How could you judge like this? Because there's going to be a Khilafa before the Mahdi comes out. Then the Khalifa dies. Now, you, you know, use your political science and what could possibly happen that will cause the Khilafa to come back? And what, where is the West? They're going to sit there and wait for the Khilafa. What's happening? Allah A'lam. It's from the unseen. When does this happen? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala A'lam. But there is a Khalifa. The Muslims unite under a Khalifa. Then the Khalifa dies. Then the three sons of this Khalifa, they fight over the treasures of the Kaaba. So the Hadith says, three sons of a Khalifa fight over the treasures of the Kaaba. And some scholars said, there might be actual treasure buried at that point under the Kaaba that they're fighting over. Or it could just indicate, yeah, and symbolically, whoever is the Khalifa owns all the treasures and he's in charge of the Kaaba. And he owns all the treasures of the, the wealthy and of the ummah. So that it could be what it means. Yaludhu, a man seeks refuge with uh, al-bayt. Yani, a man seeks refuge at the Kaaba. And he goes there. And he comes fleeing. He, he flees from Medina and goes to Mecca. Now the hadith are specifically vague. Yani, purposely, Aksul, which specifically. They're purposely vague. His Prophet is not trying to tell you everything that will happen. And he's just telling you that he is going to leave Medina, flee Medina, going to Mecca, seeking refuge there at the Kaaba. Now that means, the scholar said that he's probably, some people had their eye on him or someone thought he was special or something, but people were after him. But we don't have any of the details. And then when he goes to Mecca, then an army is sent to basically to attack him. And then the earth swallows up that army. When the earth swallows up that army, um, the Mahdi, first of all, almost overnight becomes a righteous person. So if you're sitting in your Quran class and the guy next to you says, by the way, I'm the Mahdi, tell him, no, you're not. How do you know? Well, because the Mahdi, some scholars said he's not, some scholars said he is just not religious at all. Yeah, and he doesn't even pray. Others said he's just a, like a baseline Muslim. Then Hadith says, يُصْلِحُ اللَّهُ فِي لَيْلَةِ Allah rectifies him in one night, becomes the most righteous religious person in the Ummah. Right. So the guy who memorized 16 Jews of sitting next to you in the Tahfil, it can't be him. So, anyways, I, don't like, I, I didn't really want to get into the Mahdi, but before the Mahdi, there's the Khilafah, then there's the civil war. So that means before the Khilafah, things have to happen. Like, does it look like today there could be a Khilafah? Yeah, do you think a, a CC will step down or uh, SMB or MB, Musharraf mean everyone's going to step down? Yeah, let's have a Khalifa for the sake of unity. That means we're not even close to that world, but we could be close to that world if something major happens. You see, you can't with, with the signs. You can't pinpoint it. You can't. People have always been trying this. For some of our the classical scholars try to estimate the day of judgment by calculating backwards from the Day of Judgment to the time we live today. Yani, if I can estimate and count from the major signs. But the hadith that says there's 50 years between each major sign is a weak hadith. You can't, you can't. If Allah wants to hide something from you, you're not going to cleverly figure it out. True? I wish people would remember that. If Allah wants to hide something from you, you're not going to cleverly figure it out. People are saying nonsense over the internet all the time. I'm, I'm at the end here. Uh, this one guy, he said, uh, he said that Dajjal isn't here. And Yajuj and Majuj aren't here. Just because we haven't found them. We have Google Earth. What did you expect into that? The Google car method and drove by the Dajjal and he's like, standing by. I'm coming. What did you expect exactly? Or you expected to see the barrier of Yajuj and Majuj. It's thousands of years old. You just, a big door, Mathala. No mud, moss, trees grew over it. There's no rocks all on top of it. So you just want to like cruise the earth with your mouse at home and say, there it is. Ah, I found it. You know why Allah doesn't want you to find them? Doesn't want us, meaning like 
our world today, everyone alive, Muslim, non, to find the Yujin Ma'jud? What do you think if we, if we found the barrier today, what do you think will happen? Tell me. Yeah, and the minute, yeah, first the anthropologists are going to come and then we have to examine these people and make contact with the natives of Musharraf. America will find out they have oil immediately. Yeah, and, oh, we got to give them democracy, oh, Musharraf. Introduce them to the iPhone and we're not going to leave them alone. That's why he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't allow us to find them. So, so when Allah hides something, you're not going to find it. So how come we can't find the Dajjal? I'll tell you why, Habib. Because Allah Azza doesn't want you to find it. Does that make sense to you? How come we can't find the Dajjal? I tell them, what do you want from him? Do you want to find him? You don't want to find him. Anyways, um, that was my point. It was kind of brief, but my point was that. Let me repeat it one more time. Because, and I feel free to have opinions, and I don't have any issue, and I, because I'm not saying I'm right, I'm saying it's the unseen, so bus relax, take it easy. I tell you something, you say possibly, you tell me something, hatta if it doesn't make sense, I say possibly, then I go home, I laugh at you, <laughs> but not in front of you. Because you can't tell me it's the unseen, you can't tell me what's happening exactly. So, in conclusion, the world we're in today, does it look anything like the world where the Mahdi emerges? Where the Mahdi, by the way, is one of the, it's the last thing that happens before the major sign. It's in his time, the, the first major sign occurs. And once the major signs occur, Prophet described, they come one after the other. And he gave a very nice uh, tashbih, yani visual here. He said, when you have beads in a string kida or necklace, when you cut it, what happens? The beads are gonna fall but they're going to fall immediately, one after the other, in a pattern. It's not going to be one bead falls. If I hold the necklace upside down, okay, cut it. One bead will fall. Bukra, another bead will fall. La, they're going to fall one after the other in a, with a rhythm. Like that. He said, the first one happens, the rest are going to follow like that. Like beads from a necklace. All right? So, we're saying that... Uh, the world before the, the Mahdi, forget the Dajjal, comes out, looks nothing like our world today. So it's very hard to try to say, no, the Mahdi is, is going to be out in a year or two or three. And even after we said that, we said that there could be certain catastrophic events on a global level or even economically catastrophic that will change the entire world within the span of 10 to 15 years, possibly, Matra. Or 50 years, this world will be completely different. Or 30 years, or 15. So, but when it happens, and if any of these fitting that we mentioned happen, it has to match all the signs in the hadith, all the descriptions. And not just one or two and you say, aha, that's it. Just like we saw in the beginning, a duhayma looked like COVID. But when you continue reading, it doesn't look like COVID at all. And now COVID's gone. When the guys who were saying it was COVID, it's embarrassing now, right? You're so wrong, it's embarrassing. <laughs> I'm embarrassed for you, you know what I mean? Like that. Anyways, um, I then I've got, let me just end up with this hadith, we're done. I'm not even going to explain, I'm just going to read it. It's a hadith from Surah Abu Dawood. Uh, it says, when Bayt al-Maqdis is taken, and I just want you to see the chronology here, the timeline. When Bayt al-Maqdis is taken, Medina will become abandoned. And there are many hadith about the abandonment of Medina and how the Masjid al Nabawi will become completely empty and deserted, and two wolves will come and urinate on the mimbar of the Prophet. It's very heartbreaking, these hadith. Very heartbreaking. Okay? So when Bayt al Maqdis is taken, Medina will become abandoned. When Medina becomes abandoned, there will be a great battle. And when the great battle occurs, this is the battle between. The, the Muslims and the Europeans. Initially, it was the Muslims along with the Europeans as allies fighting a common enemy, the hadith says. Then once that it's over, the Europeans betray and turn on the Muslims. And then, this is what they call Armageddon, these battles take place. And then, Constantinople will be conquered. And then the Prophet says, yani, which is Istanbul. They say how mind-blowing this is? Istanbul... It's going to be conquered by the Muslims. So, 
Sorry, but I just it's too much juicy stuff. So I said it was it was the end. But look but look at this. I mean, we can't go on without talking about this. Istanbul's gonna be conquered by the Muslims in the future. So that means we lose Istanbul. Type. So some scholars said there are two opinions. One group said that something will happen and people will lose Istanbul, meaning it will not be counted like it's part under the Muslim lands. Whatever it is that they join the EU, I don't know. Something happens, and then they, uh, the Muslims go back and bring it back to the Muslims. Now, another group of scholars, and for the record, I completely don't agree with this opinion. They said, no, no, we already lost it. When the, when the Dawla of Uthmaniya, the Ottomans collapsed in 1924, and then Kamal Ataturk came and he secularized it, we lost it. But Allah, that's not fair. Let me keep it real, that's not fair. And if you go to Istanbul today, you will hear, hear the Adhan, and you will see people memorizing the Quran, and you will see five times a day prayers in the Masajid. There is nothing less Islamic about Istanbul than pick any other city, fill in the blank. Al Muhim, the point is, let's finish it. Constantinople will be conquered, and when Constantinople is conquered, the Dajjal will appear. Now, just from this one hadith, how close, is, how close is it? If right now they free Bayt al-Maqdis in the next coming months, Allahu Akbar, then we come back and talk again. Another lecture. Are we at the end of time? <laughs> but Medina being abandoned, and he, that's, how, do you think? Who is going to Umrah in the next couple of months? You expect that when you see the crowds in Medina now in Mecca, do you imagine that, yeah, in a couple of years, nobody will bother to come to this place? We are far from that world, far from that world. But then again, maybe we're not far from that world. Something can happen that is so catastrophic, everyone abandons Medina immediately. But then there's another hadith. I just want to show you how confusing this is. Not confusing, but how you are helpless, the powers with Allah. There is another hadith that mentions how when the Dajjal appears, did you see the, court, the order here? When Medina, Bayt al-Maqdis, Medina is abandoned, a battle, Constantinople, and then the Dajjal. But then the hadith doesn't mention that the Dajjal cannot enter Mecca and Medina. So why is he entering Medina if there's nobody in it? How do we reconcile that? You see? But is it saying the time period? It's not saying how many years. Can people abandon Al Medina because of anything? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe creative. I don't know. Volcano, Musharraf, and Muhammad. And then repopulate it. Do you think it's possible? Yes, it's possible. That's why I said there are many plausible explanations. I hope nobody's confused and you, you got the answer or at least the idea. Zakim al for coming out and for listening attentively. Sallallahu wa barak ala Muhammad wa ala alihi.